Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today and welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Katerina Haverland and I lead growing Google efforts at Google. And um, um, I have a great pleasure and honor to have here today a very special guest, Mo Gavda. Hi, Mo. Hey, nice Hello. to be back. <laughs> it's great to have you. So Mo is here today to talk to all of you about control, which is a pervasive modern day illusion, as he calls it. And um, it leads to work-related stress and um, often it blurs our judgment and leads to wrong decisions among um, you know, people at work. And it also goes home with us to cause suffering and unhappiness. And Mo is a former control freak, if I may <laughs> say so, who learned, um, unfortunately, the hard way, the truth about control. And he will talk about many things, but also concepts that not only helped him advance his career to reach the highest levels of success as the chief business officer of Google X, but it also helped him survive the tragic loss of his wonderful son, Ali, turning his loss into a global mission and a movement to make millions of people happy by writing this tremendous book called Solve for Happy. So without further introductions, I would like to kindly ask Mo to give us a lecture about the illusion of control, and then we will ask some questions. So over to you, Mo. Thank you, Katerina. It's always good to be back. I'm uh, hoping that there will be a few friends in the audience today. Uh, and uh, I'm, as always, now that I'm no longer a control freak, I'm totally unprepared. I just scribbled a few notes on uh, on a screen here, and I'll try to, to take you through them uh, because the, the topic is quite timely. Uh, you know, um, we've been in lockdown, in a bit of a panic mode. Uh, we've been uh, listening to um, the news media telling us that everything's going out of control, that you know the economic situation is not great, that we're losing lives, that we're unable to contain the virus, uh, that you know this is a pandemic that is unprecedented since the 1920s or whatever that is. And it's quite uh, um, uh, difficult for many of us in many ways. You know, some of us are suffering from uh, just the idea of the lockdown itself. Uh, some of us are <coughs> suffering from worry and fear. Some of us may have lost a loved one, uh, but many of us are suffering in my personal point of view uh, from lack of control, from I don't know how to handle this. This is a first time thing for me. I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know uh, how I can make life um, sort of yield to my wishes and my hopes. And that makes things uh, a little difficult. So I want to talk about the topic of control, as Kat Kat said, from a um, from a, a, contr a retired control freak point of view. And I actually want to start by helping you align with me on what is that topic of control. So I, I want everyone to, if you don't mind, uh, just find a pen or anything that you can dangle, a keychain, uh, you know, your phone, whatever that is. Okay, and and I want you to 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 hold it from the top so that it's free to move, almost like a pendulum, if you want, right? And if you if you take your pen and and basically keep it that way, uh, it takes very little effort from your side to take it, uh, you know, to keep it in that position, which is known as equilibrium for any for any pendulum, right? If you want to control the position of the pen outside equilibrium, so if you want to just take it a little bit off its center to the side, it takes a tiny bit of effort. So of course, if it's a pen and it's very lightweight, uh, it's it's not a lot of effort when you think about it. Huh? It's just your, you put your finger here and, and it's very easy to move. Okay, and I, and I want you to actually practically make that move. Just try and see what it takes. It takes a bit of force. And for as long as you want the pen to be off its equilibrium, uh, you will have to keep that force applied, okay? And once you leave it, it goes back to its equilibrium point. Now, when you think about it, that act of control, that act of taking something outside its balance, is an act that we apply to a lot of things in our daily lives uh, every single minute of every day, okay? And that act might appear just like keeping the pen of its balance point appears to be simple because control is force applied over a very long period of time 
that effort becomes quite significant, okay? And, and I want you to try and imagine a few changes to this experiment. So one change is imagine if this hanging from its uh, you know, top is not a pen, but it's a, a, a rod, a, a steel rod that weighs 100 pounds. And, and you were supposed to move it this way. The force that you apply will be a lot more than your finger. Okay? You will need to apply a lot more force to, to get to that state of control. Right? If you were even, even if it's just this pen, and you want it to keep it off its balance for, say, 10 hours, okay? Just up, keeping your finger in this place for 10 hours, as simple as that task may appear, I can guarantee you over 20, 30 minutes, you're gonna, get, you're gonna, you're gonna start to get fatigued, you're gonna start to get pain in your hand, you're not gonna be able to keep that pen in that position uh, for too long. So the amount of force you need to apply and the amount of time uh, you, you, you need to keep it out, you know, in a, in a control position makes the task a little harder. Now imagine on the, uh, you know, the third uh, co concept to, to think about that it's not one pen, but I had 60 pens lined up for you. And I wanted you to hold each of them off its center a little bit. And how much effort will you have to apply to just jump between them and try to keep each of them in that off balance position when they're not one not two, but 40, 50, 60 things. So the idea of control is an attempt to keep things off their natural balance. Off the natural balance, you apply force over time. And the further you apply that, so if you want to take it all the way up here and you let go, look at what the pen does. It goes all the way to the other side and then a little bit here and then a little bit there and just moves and oscillates until it gets to equilibrium and that kind of behavior leads to chaos so you know you try to control your weight for example by applying a lot of force to your diet and starving yourself so much that when the minute the diet stops you go back the other way you gain a little bit or a lot of the weight back and then you apply diet again and then you know it's just that pendulum swing and that seems to be the nature of our life when we're attempting to apply control. Now, the real question I sometimes ask people, and they normally get the answer wrong, is how many things are you trying to keep in control every day? Okay, And most people will say, ah, yeah, I mean, I try to control two or three things. And I'm, I'll, I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about this. Huh? Um, how many things do we try to control on a daily basis? And my answer is, if you're a Googler, if you're someone who's into technology and is listening to this talk, it's probably around 100 things, okay? And yes, you're gonna say, no, of course not. But then I'll tell you, yes, you try to control uh, coming here on time. You try to control your diet and convince yourself that quinoa is delicious. You try to control your children and convince them that they shouldn't play you try to control yourself and not go to the bathroom because you have to finish a, 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 you know, a, 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 an email first. And there are so many little attempts of control that happen in our life that are actually quite tiring, right? It's those 60 pens that I tell you we're trying to keep off balance all the time. And the more interesting thing that we don't realize is that things, surprisingly, if I ask you how many do you actually keep within control, you'll be surprised to know that almost none of them are actually fully under control, okay? And once again, people will say, what are you talking about? My team is under control, my work is under control, my children are disciplined and they are obedient. Everything is under control. Yes, it's under control for as long as you have that you know, the difficult effort of applying force to it. Okay, but nothing remains within control unless you have that effort in it. And once you remove the effort, everything falls out of control. Now, this is not me giving you a philosophical view of control. This is actually the reality of the laws of physics that the, the universe is designed around. So anyone that understands the basic, basic rules of physics, starting from you know, the second law of thermodynamics all the way 
to uh, to our understanding of the universe expanding and uh, you know the the, the way uh, our uh, our you know the mechanics of the universe work it's all built on something that's called entropy entropy or chaos theory if you want that describes that uh, um, uh, you know behavior of the universe is the tendency for physical phenomena to break down to go out of control right so if you if you drop an egg or a glass it breaks and even though mathematically there is one probability that that glass would break and then all of the pieces would fly in the air and then come together so that the molecular uh, attra you know as uh, um, uh, forces between between the uh, the different components fit together so that the glass comes together uh, unbroken that's actually a plausible scenario in mathematics the chaos theory says that this scenario is one in trillions of scenarios and it rarely ever happens if at all if it happens at all and accordingly you're almost certain that every time you're going to drop an egg the egg is going to break and not unbreak that if re every time you leave a garden uh, unhedged it's going to grow wild and not hedge itself that every time you leave your children uh, to you know express themselves they're going to play and jump up and down and might actually shout and scream and that's the nature of the universe that we live in you know Nassim Talib talks about what we are now living in his great book the the black swan and the mathematics of major events that affect our life that are rare in occurrence but when they occur they completely change everything and one of them is the idea of the black swan that we're now living through right is that uh, you know an a pandemic uh, unexpected at the beginning or at least for many of us unexpected at the beginning of the year would change everything would put us under lockdown or get us to work from home will force us to stay with our partners at home and so on and so forth but, so this is one one phenomena that is rare in occurrence but major in its impact and the other phenomena of course that we always remember is the idea of butter butterfly effects which are little little effects little changes in the life in life as we know it that have a very far reaching impact when compounded and you know the example of butterfly effects basically is about uh, weather prediction and the fact that you know uh, changes in wind speeds that are analogous to the uh, the you know the flappings of the wing of a butterfly in brazil can lead to a hurricane in florida okay and between butterflies and black swans I, be, I basically believe that nothing in our universe is under control. And am I saying that to tell you that, you know, give up on control? Of course I'm not, okay? Uh, you know, I think our attempt to control certain events in our life is what made humanity successful, okay? Is what made us safe, is what created civilization, is what allowed us to, uh, uh, you know, build Android phones and, you know, create technology and so on and so forth is through that attempt of control. But what I'm asking us to do is to understand the nature of the beast, to understand the nature of control so that when we deal with it, we can deal with the practicality side of control, but not the unhappiness side of control. Now, attempting to be always in control, I can promise you as a retired control freak, is a guaranteed, an absolute guaranteed recipe for unhappiness. And the reason I say that is because if some of you may have not uh, uh, been exposed to my work before, is because I have an equation for happiness. And my happiness equation is very straightforward. It says your happiness is equal to or greater than the difference between the events of your life and your expectations and hopes and wishes of how life should behave. Okay, so basically every event that happens in your life you compare that event in your head to how you would have wanted that event to be, okay? And if the event falls short from your expectations from life, you feel unhappy. So rain never makes anyone happy or unhappy. There is no inherent value of happiness in rain. Uh, the rain makes you happy when you are uh, uh, you know, you know, interested to water your plants, for example, and it makes you unhappy if you want to sunbathe. Okay, and so the event itself has no inherent value of happiness, but the idea of you uh, uh, of the event missing your expectations is what makes you happy or unhappy. Now, with that in mind, you have to start thinking about um, um, control as an expectation that is rarely ever met, because those who want control in their life 
are expecting that life is constantly going to comply to what they need life to be, okay? And as a control freak, as a retired control freak, that gave me tremendous unhappiness, okay? So I was very concerned about the environment. I, I, I'm not making this up, it was actually true. I gave my wonderful ex-wife a, uh, a spreadsheet that basically said, based on what I've seen from the consumption rates of, my, of the kids and myself, uh, I would recommend that you plug the, this data into the spreadsheet and it will tell you when to wash the colors and when to wash the, uh, the, the whites. And that way we can save the environment a little bit of water and reduce the impact of the soap that we use. And, and poor Nibel would look at me you know, and smile and hug me and say, sure, baby, I'm, I'm going to do that. And of course she wouldn't. Right. And, you know, maybe that event didn't, uh, you know, piss me off at the time, but other events did. It's like I expected that every time I traded in the stock market because I'm supposed to be mathematically clever, I would make money every time. And, and you have to learn the hard way that the stock market is designed for you to soon lose sometimes and win sometimes. OK, that nothing is ever always under control, that when I, you know, design myself uh, and a, a path to get from my office to a client that it's supposed to take 40 minutes and Google told me it, it took 40 minutes or at the time there was no Google and you know it, it, it ends up taking 32 instead of 40 and now I have wasted eight minutes and that's to me believe it or not a reason to be upset that events didn't meet my expectations I wasted eight minutes and so between events and expectations control freaks are some of the unhappiest people on the planet and the reason they are some of the unhappiest people on the planet is because their expectation is so unrealistic. They expect to always be in control and life never gives us that control. As a matter of fact, through entropy, life is designed to break that illusion of control. That's one thing. The other thing, of course, is the, is the effort. Hmm? Just the fact that you're constantly putting in effort to keep so many pendulums off their center, okay, is just by definition tiring, it's stressful. It takes so much mind work. It takes so much concern and worry and design and planning. It takes so much future centricity that you actually rarely ever stay in the moment, okay? And because you're control freakish, you're constantly planning, you're constantly analyzing, and you're constantly trying to keep things in control, and that leads you to unhappiness. So the real question is, if you want to be happy and successful, Okay, so if you want to be happy, you should give up on control. You should do what the you know Hindus, for example, call detachment, which is I'm going to do the best I can, but I'm not really responsible for the result. This is also a Muslim uh, 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 spiritual uh, you know belief that basically everything is in the hand of the designer of the of God, and so I will do my absolute best. But they say, Insha Allah, if you know if God is willing for this to happen, it will happen. And I believe in that. I believe in the idea of, the, of, of surrendering sometimes to the mighty wheels of life. But at the same time, I also believe in the idea of attempting to move the wheels of life in a direction that's good for you, good for your family, good for society, good for humanity at large. Okay? And so to be able to do that, to be able to have an impact in life, you also have to apply or at least aspire for a little bit of control, for some control. OK, and the wisdom when it comes to the topic of control is really all about what is, what is it that you should control? OK, what is it that you should control and how should you react when things fall out of control? Now, to try and explain what it is that you should you should control, um, you start to ask yourself if I was given everything that I attempted to control today, and let's say you counted 48 things, okay? Uh, and I ranked them in order. And I said, the most important of them was this one, and the least important of them was that one, and everything is ranked in between. Should, wouldn't it be wise for you to say to yourself, I should attempt to control the most important ones first, and then second, and then third, and then fourth, and if I run out of bandwidth or if I run out of happiness, because happiness is my priority, I should probably stop at number six. And, you know, maybe number seven uh, is not worth me destroying my own happiness for seven years. OK, and it's a very interesting question huh? because that question requires a bit of reflection of what what matters most. 
Hmm? Does it matter most that uh, Nibel, my wonderful ex-wife, uh, would wash the whites and uh, and uh, and uh, colors in an exact moment in time? Does it matter most that I arrive efficiently at my meeting exactly on time and not eight minutes late and not four minutes? Sorry, not eight minutes early and not four minutes late. Or is it? Or, or does it matter more for me to be relaxed and unstressed and joyful when I arrive at that meeting? Okay, or does it matter more for me and Nivelle to be close and loving and happy and not too worried about too many details and too many control uh, issues? Okay, and I, 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 I attempt to, to, to leave this up to you. I can give you a methodic, uh, uh, you know, mathematical way of how you should prioritize things and how, you know, where to draw the line, but maybe that's too much control. Maybe you should ask this yourself the question, in reality, what's the truth? How many things am I trying to control? How many of them really matter? And how many of them can I give up on? Okay. And if I give up on them, is there a way for me to continue to be successful in life, achieve 95% of my aspirations without really having to control the 80% that, that, that are needed, uh, the 80% of the issues that I'm trying to control, which lead to additional 5% of aspirations in life? Very, very, very interesting question. And one of my most inspiring movies, I use a lot of movies when I, when I try to talk about uh, topics uh, of human development, uh, because you can relate to them. One of my favorite movies of all time is the movie Forrest Gump. And I'm sure some of you have seen it. And if you've seen it, you must have loved it, right? And Forrest Gump gives you that uh, view of a wonderful human being that's able to flow through life with very, very, very little control. Okay, flow through life with um, um, an optimism that life will always be okay, right? Flow with life with an, a sense of adventure that being on a shrimping boat or being a, a, you know, a baseball player, either way is part of the journey of living. And he ends up being rich and he ends up being, you know, in, investing in Apple, uh, thinking that it's a fruit company very, very early on and making money and so on. Wonderful story that maybe is a little too romantic for the control freaks. But believe it or not, I know tons of billionaires. And I know that many of them did not make it through control, but made it through doing things that they love, uh, that were things that, uh, you know, at the right time, that fit their skills and fit the world that they were trying to, to, to serve. Now, when we go to the reality of control, uh, it's important for me to tell you uh, uh, so, so one side is, yeah, maybe you should prioritize what you, what you attempt to control. But I want you to understand that whatever it is that you prioritize and whatever it is that you attempt to control, there are only two things in life, hmm? only two things in life that you can actually control. And, and the thought experiment I normally use to explain this concept is a bit of a game show, if you want. You know, imagine that you are part of a new game show, similar to that old show that was called Survivors, where you're stranded on an island. And the only trick with that game show is that anything that falls out of your control will work against you, OK? So if you take with you a knife to the island, uh, yes, you can use the knife to cut things and maybe hunt or whatever. But then the minute the, the knife is not within your control, it's going to stab you in the heart, right? Uh, you know, if you take with you a, a gallon of water, yes, the gallon of water will help you to, to uh, drink while you're awake. But once you fall asleep and you don't drink, control the water, it will drown you and, and, and kill you. And, you know, it's a bit of an imaginary high tech uh, game show, if you want. OK, but if you actually spend time this evening thinking about that game show and imagining that you're part of it, you will realize that nothing, nothing that you can take to that island will not will always be in control okay can you take your friends to the island no your friends sometimes uh, prefer other things over you they are not always within control can you take your partner with you hello remember all of those fire you know fights where your partner wanted to kill you okay uh, can you take a, a car yeah we'll move you around but then eventually uh, you know um, basically uh, um, hit you in a in a wall once one side once it's out of control and so on Right? The only two things in life that you can actually control, the only two things in life you can take with you to the island, interestingly, are not material things. 
they're your actions and your attitudes. And by actions, I don't actually mean the results of your actions. I mean just your actions. When a situation arises, okay, your attitude of how do I respond to that situation, okay, and then the actual actions that you take from that moment when the situation arises are really what's going to determine, determine your state of happiness and your state of success. Now, let me give you uh, clear examples. Again, maybe we can use some movies. One of my favorite movies uh, of all time uh, is the movie uh, Life is Beautiful. If you remember, that movie was about an Italian father, a Jewish father, uh, that got uh, sent to a concentration camp along with his child. And uh, instead of uh, witnessing the horrors of the, of the camp, he convinced his child that this was a game and that the winner of the game is going to win a tank. And to win the game, you have to hide from the soldiers. Okay? And so the attitude of the child became, this is a game. Let's play. Okay? Let's have fun. Let's enjoy it. Let's hide. And he wasn't scared. He wasn't attempting to, to, you know, to, to run away out of fear. He wasn't screaming. And yeah, despite the horrors that was in, in, in a situation like this, which we, I think all humans can relate to until today, that child was actually saved as a result. And the, the whole movie became a wonderful story of a father and a child relationship. If you haven't seen it, that is really the power of your attitude. And your attitude is about everything. Huh? You, can, you can take an attitude about the current political climate in the world and get grumpy about it. Or you can say, well, politics are politics and I need to do something about it. And here is how, how I'm going to engage. You can take an attitude around how your partner sometimes does things that annoy you. Or you can tell yourself she's wonderful or he's wonderful in so many other ways. And I'm going to always be supportive and wonderful in the way I speak to them. More importantly than your attitude, because attitude alone serves you, but doesn't serve and serves you and, and presents you to others in a positive way, but doesn't change much. What changes much is actions. And my favorite movie on that topic is uh, Apollo 13. And in Apollo 13, uh, you know, uh, the, the mission is going to the moon, something goes wrong, and they no longer are getting to the moon, but also they are almost certainly going to lose their lives. And if you have seen the movie, Tom Hanks, uh, uh, you know, captain of the ship, uh, comes, uh, you know, to the microphone and says the very famous uh, statement that we frequently repeat, Houston, we have a problem. So calmly, almost as if he has a flat tire, right? It's like, no, nah, we have a problem, right? And yeah, that's the right attitude, by the way. Huh? Houston, we have a problem. We need to work on this problem. And then they go through a long checklist, engineering-wise, of what went wrong, what material do they have on the ship to fix it, how much does the oxygen last them, and so on and so forth. And as a result of those actions, when things went out of control, they managed to come back to Earth safely. Now, I would want to ask every one of us to think about the situation we're in and really question what attitude have we taken and what actions we can take so that we can come out of this better than we came in. And I think this is truly the core reason of why I wanted to have this conversation with you today. To arm you with a, uh, a bit of my philosophy, if you want, and that becomes my closing remark before we open to questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it, it, some of you know my story, and my story is I had this wonderful being in my life uh, that was my son, my best friend, my coach, and my mentor in many, many ways. He was an unusually enlightened being that taught me so much about myself and about what I did wrong in life and what I could learn and so on and so forth in a loving way. And then I lost Ali. I lost him to a, uh, to a preventable medical error, uh, totally out of control. Huh? I, I had planned everything in life for that child. Huh? I'm... I was a capable, reasonably wealthy Google executive. I am a serial entrepreneur, so I would send him to the right university. I bought him assets. I even started businesses in the major that he chose so that when he graduates, he runs those businesses. When he changed majors midway, I started other businesses. I had everything planned for him. Everything was under control. And then one little, literally pinprick 
one needle went in the wrong artery and I lost my son. And for those situations that go completely out of control, hmm, there is, again, a spiritual belief that I have come to call committed acceptance. Okay? Committed acceptance is not an attitude of surrender. Okay? Committed acceptance is an attitude of acceptance from a, from a place of strength, followed by a commitment to make the world or my world better despite the presence of what went out of control. Let me give you uh, an example, okay? So you lose a child, it's the most painful thing you can think about ever. And uh, you can, you know, you've, you, you sort of earn the right in the eyes of society to spend the rest of your life crying. And so nobody would have blamed me if you've hugged Ali once, uh, you would understand. You know, if I closed my, my, my door and never showed up at Google again, I was the chief business officer of Google X at the time, it would have been fine, okay? Everyone would have understood. But what difference would it have made to the world? What difference would it have made to me? What difference would it have made to him? Hmm? And, and these are really interesting questions because when you really think about it, if I had hit myself against the wall 27 years after his death, on my deathbed, he would still not be back. And that's really interesting when things go out of control and we're unable to get them back in control, at least us and as individuals. Huh? So maybe humanity combined can get COVID-19 back under control, but you as an individual, you don't have much control of the situation. What do you do? Do you hit yourself against the wall for 27 years? Or do you accept the new reality and assume that this is the new baseline of your life? And based on that new baseline, you start to see what you can do to make life better despite the new baseline. And in my, my story, you know, my brain basically gave me quite a few alternatives of that's it. I don't think you should engage in life anymore. Ali's left. That's it. You know, I'm not interested. Until one day, uh, you know, my brain started to attack me very strongly and say, you should have driven him to another hospital. And I went back to my brain openly and I said, okay, brain, I wish I did. I don't think I can go back in time now and do that. Is there anything you can tell me that I, and I can actually do, right? Which is a very simple question that, by the way, most of us as managers and, and senior leaders learn. Huh? When someone walks into your office and is upset about something, you ask them the question, what can we do about it? And eventually my brain came back and said, okay, you can probably you know, make people learn what he taught you. You can share his story in writing the book that became Soul for Happy. Uh, you can uh, you know, share that with the world and give yourself a mission of uh, one billion happy people. Yeah, you may never reach one billion, but if you reach a few hundred thousand, if you reach a few million, if you reach tens of millions, that's a massive, massive change for the world. They get to know Ali, they get to, to love him as much as I did. And it doesn't bring him back, but it makes the world better and it makes my world better, okay? And when you think about it, that's exactly what happened. The world and my world is much better as a result of me accepting the loss of my child and then committing to make my life and the world better despite that situation. Until today, believe it or not, I wake up at least two, three times a week and I miss him. It hurts, right? As a parent, when you lose a child, it hurts. And committed acceptance takes me back. So I keep starting new things. You know, I just started my podcast, which is doing really, really well, changing the lives of thousands of people only three months in, uh, you know, part of the top 10 podcasts worldwide, top 10% uh, podcasts worldwide. And it's spreading happiness and it's making a difference. And every time I get a, uh, a uh, response back from someone saying this really changed my life, I feel that this was Ali and the loss of Ali and committed acceptance. So I will close by saying this. You too can apply committed acceptance to your life, to your work, to your relationships. You, can, you too can choose to control certain things and let other things dangle in their equilibrium, okay? Because the things we don't try to control will go out of control until they reach that balance. And once you do that, you will start to find yourself in a situation where that balance, that situation is so much easier to go through life with. 
for most things, 90% of things don't really deserve the amount of attention we put to controlling them. For the few things that we try to control, try your best to control them. But if they fall out of control, ask yourself this. Can I accept them and do better despite their presence? And once you do that, you'll find that what we're going through as humanity is actually not that bad at all. Because I'll tell you openly, during the lockdown, I found the most time to reflect. I must found the most time to connect. I found the most time to do good in life. I started amazing projects. Okay, I uh, I, I gave uh, to you know and improved my karma for those for those people that were not as fortunate as I am. And through those acts, okay, I lost weight. I worked out. I uh, made decisions on uh, on where I want to live and how I want to live going forward. I meditated more uh, more um, rigorously. Rigorously, I um, I started the podcast as I told you, and so on. And you know, when you really think about it, yes, of course, as humanity, we lost quite a few uh, things that are precious to us, but we've gained quite a few things as a result. And those of us who committed and accepted. I think are coming out of this much, much, much better than they came in. So I'll stop here and take questions. So first of all, thank you, Mo, for sharing your story. It's just truly, you know, it's so inspirational and hopefully um, will help many other people to go through stuff the right way. So thanks for that. Um, you mentioned your book, um, Sulfur Happy. So um, in which you, you know, talk um, about happiness and the equation and so on. So my first question to you would be around what does happiness um, mean to you um, as a person? Yeah, what happiness is, is actually quite a difficult question. Huh? Because if you ask a lot of people, many people will, will see it differently. And some people will, will see that happiness is that dance party that you go to on Friday. Others will say happiness is in going on a surfing vacation and others will say happiness is eating a burger and so on and so forth. These are, sadly are what I call weapons of mass distraction. So weapons of mass distraction are products, items, things, experiences that we have replaced happiness with. From the happiness equation, happiness is that calm, peaceful feeling you get when you're okay with life as it is. When you look at the events of life, and say, those events, they match my expectations, okay? My partner is nice, he's kind, he is uh, understanding, he clearly loves me, but he has four hairs in his ear and that pisses me off, right? I am the four hairs, they drive me crazy, but put it all together, I'm okay with him as he is, okay? And when you really think about happiness from that point of view, it is the foundation on top of which all of the other experience come along. So the experience of us, uh, you know, wanting to go surfing or going on vacation on its own is what I call the state of escape. The state of escape is I'm unable to escape my unhappiness. And so I will engage in experiences that will numb my brain. It will get me so occupied in what I'm doing that I won't be able to solve the happiness equation. And when I don't solve the happiness equation, I don't compare events to expectations. And when I don't compare events to expectations, my actual uh, state of life is uh, happy. So, so all children are happy because they don't realize that there is anything to be unhappy about. Now, if, if you apply that feeling, if you apply that approach to life, you start to, to understand the, the, even the chemical makeup of us when we are happy and when we are having fun, because these are very, very different. Most of the productized happiness produces dopamine, which is a, re a reward hormone that we feel, that makes us feel uh, um, um, rewarded. So it, it basically gets us to want more of it, of something, right? It's the, it's, it's the hormone you get when you win something. It's the hormone you get when you uh, engage in, uh, in pleasurable activities and so on and so forth. Right, hope, hope, dopamine is an excitatory, so it's basically uh, keeping you wanting to go for more. When you're happy, interestingly, the hormone that you get in your body is serotonin, and serotonin is a, a calmer. It is a, it is an, a hormone that literally does nothing but say, uh, "Let's engage the parasympathetic nervous system. Everything is okay as it is right now. I don't want to change anything. 
let's you know stop engaging in life and just focus on our breathing and focus on our digestion and focus on relaxing and feel uh, you know at peace okay the interesting uh, difference between them is that because dopamine is an excitatory once you have dopamine in your blood serotonin goes away okay so the reality is that you cannot be happy and calm and peaceful if you're all constantly injecting yourself with fun and pleasure and things okay because those things basically remove the happiness uh, the, the, the ability to find that calm and peace i'm not saying you shouldn't have fun by the way i'm just saying don't have fun as a painkiller okay so if you have a reason to be unhappy the answer is to work on your unhappiness to get to that calm and peaceful state first and then add to that what makes you have fun what makes you excited what makes you exhilarated and so on and so forth mm -hmm. yeah you to explain that to my husband by the way <laughs> <laughs> um, you also mentioned um, that you know that with your book there is somehow this mission of uh, making it's one billion people happy now um and it's kind of a movement so my second question is around like what does the mission really mean in reality and how how is it happening because billion or million even is you know big numbers yeah uh, no i mean we know at google that a billion is not a big number but uh, but i will tell you openly honestly i will tell you i i don't i don't think i will ever achieve a billion and i don't i hope that i alone don't achieve a billion so 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 a mission of reaching a billion people believe it or not with a bit of investment in online advertising you can get you can reach a billion people and have your 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 you know 18 minutes of fame in a ted talk and say hey you know we've developed this wonderful thing and it reached a billion people mm. but that would be lying about what i believe is the most important mission on our planet today okay the most important mission on our planet today in my view relates to that idea of finding the calm and peace of being okay with life so that we engage with life differently. So happiness is not a luxury to me. Happiness is the reason we're destroying our planet is because we're unable to get that state of union, of harmony, of caring about our happiness and the happiness, our own happiness and the happiness of all beings around us. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about it, uh, one billion happy, is a very simple mission of what I call pay it forward. Again, I use movies a lot, and one of Ali's, my son's favorite movies, was a, was a movie called, called Pay It Forward, which is the idea of if I can, com if I can show you today, uh, all, all, all was watching us, uh, that happiness is your priority, that it's as important as your success, even more important if you ask me, not that you should drop success, but that if you have a choice between happiness and success, you should probably choose what makes you happy first because that will lead you to success. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and basically, if I can convince you that this is uh, important, then uh, the, the trigger of my mission has happened, which is then you need to go out and do one of two actions. If you see your happiness as your priority, then you should invest in your happiness, just like you invest in your fitness. Okay? So everyone knows that if you make fitness your priority, that's not going to make you fit. You can make fitness your priority, but do nothing about it and end up with a massive belly. Right? If you want to make fitness your priority, you need to go and work out three to four times a week. You need to do the work. Right? And happiness is the same. If you, if you make happiness your priority and, and do the work, watch a video, uh, read a book, uh, you know, discuss happiness with others, join a group, uh, engage in, in practices of gratitude, meditation, uh, you know, work on your control freakishness and so on and so forth. If you, if you do the work, that's when you realize that happiness will happen. So make it your priority is, is the first pillar of the, of the um, mission. Work on your own happiness and invest in your own happiness is the second pillar. And the third pillar is have the compassion in you to spread that happiness to others. And I use the simple exponential function by saying that if everyone on this call told two people what they learned, made them prioritize their happiness and made them promise to tell two other people, and they then went to two more each, then two people will tell two people will tell two people, and then it will go into the exponential exponential function. And within five years, we would reach five, we would reach a billion happy. And that's my dream. So when when I really talk to my team around the mission, I say, success of this mission is that we 
manage to reach a million champions that reach a billion happy and that we get completely forgotten. And, and, and to get completely forgotten is fundamental for the success of this so that it's not a dependent on, on my presence or the presence of the one billion happy team. It's dependent on everyone championing happiness as their part of their purpose of life. I think it's a wonderful message to all of us listening um, here today. So definitely make that my mission as well. Um, we, <laughs> we mentioned a little bit, you know, the COVID-19, uh, which, as, as you said, has been for most of us an um, unexpected event, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I was just wondering, in your book, you, you talk about the equation, uh, which is about events and it's about the expectations, but how does the equation changes or not when it comes to something that is unexpected, that it's just like out of nowhere? Is it unexpected really? So I don't know. I, 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 I actually have a, I have a lot, I've, you know, again, if you work at Google, you remember that we were always data driven. Data trumps all opinions. Huh? Mm -hmm. Now, let me give you a bit of data. Let's start historically. Hmm? If you were born in 1900, by uh, age 14, there was World War I, uh, where 22 million people died. By age uh, 18, there was the Spanish flu, 50 million people died. Uh, by, 20, by age 29, there was the Great Depression. By age 39, 75 million people died in World War II. And by age 50, uh, smallpox had already killed 300 million people, if I remember correctly, during that uh, century. Okay, I'm 53, I've seen none of those, right? And uh, I'll tell you openly, uh, and I please, please don't take this as carelessness from me. Every life matters, huh? but numbers are important. To understand and see the truth is what gets us to set the right expectations. Huh? Uh, to COVID-19 so far in the last six months, we've lost somewhere above 500,000 people, maybe 600,000 people. 90% of them were vulnerable, so they were uh, above the age of 65 and suffered from other reasons uh, of being vulnerable. 70% were above, above the age of 75. And uh, for, one, for every one person that we lost to COVID-19, we lost three others to uh, other respiratory diseases, including influenza, which we don't talk about, which is part of our life on a daily basis, and we don't even discuss it. Okay, if you count the number of deaths to medical malpractice uh, that killed my son, it's tenfold higher than the, the numbers. I don't know if it's exactly 10, but it's several fold higher than COVID-19. Now, mm -hmm. let's understand the truth. Hmm? The truth is we get sick. The truth is we humans die. The truth is there are viruses out there. And the fact that we did not see that before makes us quite lucky. But that shouldn't set our expectation that life is not going to test us every now and then, that life is not going to, to, to give us a, a, a bit of hardship every now and then. And if you don't mind me saying, and I please, please, please take this as someone who is completely humbled by the blessings I have been given in life, right? But if you did not get sick and did not lose any loved one, uh, uh, to, to COVID-19 and did not uh, suffer serious economic uh, deprivation as a result of COVID-19, then you absolutely have no problem other than being forced to sit on your sofa and surf social media, okay? And if you call that a test, then go to Syria and understand what real tests are. Go to Africa and understand how harsh can life, life can be. Go to India and see how, say, see how diseases can take over thousands of people. And I think the challenge we have, and I say that very, very openly, is a challenge of expectations. I'm here with you, talking to you over a technology that we didn't have just 10, 15 years ago, connecting with thousands of people, okay? Happily in my living room, going back to my habits of cooking and feeling healthy and fine. And yeah, I wear a mask, I take care of myself. And by the way, if I catch the disease, I'm hopeful that I'll be fine. And if I'm not fine, you know what? We die. You're more likely to be in a car accident than you are to die of COVID-19. Now, put all of that together and ask yourself, where is the problem? 
The problem is we've somehow forgotten with our ego as humanity that sometimes life with its mighty wheels will be bigger than us and that we will be out of control. Okay? Somehow we forgot that life with its mighty wheels, when we've been destroying our environment so much, might actually react by saying, guys, can you just stay at home for two months? Like, seriously, just give me two months to recover the, qu the quality of the air. Okay? Like my daughter, you know, when this all started, my daughter was telling me, Papa, you know what this feels like? It feels like life is basically looking at us and saying, life or God or whichever you want to believe in. Huh? Life is looking at us and saying, that's it. I've had it with you humans. You're grounded. Go back to your room and think about what you've been doing. This is it. This is, if you're in this conference call, and if you're in this webinar, right? This is it. This is what we've, we're suffering from, being asked to sit on our sofas and watch Netflix. How horrible. Great. Um, thanks for putting things into perspective. It's uh, quite refreshing. So my last uh, question is around what practical advice um, would, you, would you give to our global, global audience? I, I believe that this is a moment in life where we need to dig deep and find what our humanity is about. Okay, and I'll tell you openly that if you put things in perspective, hmm, uh, as we got locked down, for example, huh, as we got locked down, we also got economic purchasing power, believe it or not, because I can guarantee you without your commute, without your, the, you know, the cost of, uh, of, uh, of dining out and traveling and all of that, most of us are spending less than we used to before COVID-19. At the same time, where some of us have lost their jobs, and nations at large are suffering from economic crisis. So I, I've spent a, a couple of months in a, a few months in a in a, an, a you know a village in the Dominican Republic that's called Cabarete, that is highly dependent on um, on tourism, and they are now suffering 84 percent unemployment. Now, if you want to reach inside and make COVID-19 teach you your humanity, I'd say the top, top, top feature of humanity is compassion, okay? So you might as well tell yourself, how much did I, did I save on monthly basis? And maybe give that out to someone else, okay? My advice, which I had from one guest, uh, Kevin, uh, on, on my podcast, which was super enlightening, he said, I'm going into this with one intention, which is to come out of it better than I came in. Okay, better than I came in is up to you to choose. You may want to uh, work out and be fitter. You may want to learn the guitar or you may want to work on yourself and find your compassion and find your, uh, your self-love and find you know, your ability to be present and so on and so forth. Whatever it is that you're going through right now, it's an opportunity that life is giving you, giving you a little more time, giving you a little more space, giving you a lot more uh, information so that you can make decisions that make you come out of this better than you came in. That's a great advice. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, do we have any questions from anyone listening? William, how do you think about striving for great things and the benefits that may bring to society versus the likely unhappiness of not achieving them? Beautiful question, William. This is a great question. So, by the way, this is the question I always get from achievers, okay? It's like, uh, are, you, are you saying that, uh, that by lowering our expectations, we will be happier? Yeah, sadly, you can, uh, you know, debate that with whoever designed life as it is. Lowering your expectations makes you happier. So in India, when they don't expect to eat for days, if you give them a bowl of rice, they feel very happy. In America, if the fries are not perfect, we feel unhappy, okay? And so, and so because expectations are lower, lower your, your chance of being happier is higher. That's that, but that doesn't make you successful in life. And I am a huge believer. I mean, look at me, I'm still actively engaged in life, uh, you know, doing my podcast, doing writing more books, engaged in my mission, working on my startup, and many other things. The reason is because each of us is here in life to achieve something, to have an impact, to 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 leave a positive mark on humanity and on being at large. Now, the only difference you need to to recognize is there is a difference between expectation and ambition. 
okay? Ambition is to directionally say, if my life was worthwhile, I will achieve something. I will go in that direction and I'll get to a billion happy, right? That's an ambition. That's a directional strategy for my life, okay? And a far enough target that makes me strive and strive and strive and do the best that I can, okay? But expectation is to tell myself openly, you know, other than Larry Page and a few other tech, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurs, it took Jesus, and, uh, you know, 2,000 years to, to reach a billion people. Who am I? Right. I'm, I'm you know, if I don't reach a billion people, that doesn't make me unsuccessful in any way. It does. It shouldn't make me unhappy. So while my ambition is a billion happy, my actual expectation is I don't know if I'll ever reach that. And I wouldn't be unhappy if I don't. OK, so Larry Page actually was the one that taught us this. Larry Page always said expectations are set to be missed. And I don't know if that's still part of the culture of Google, but I love that statement, hmm? which is the idea like Michelangelo uh, used to say of setting a target that is high enough hmm? and even and missing it is better than setting a target that is very low and achieving it. OK, so if you don't get them mixed up, set as many ambitions as you want. Hmm? But when they are missed, handle them with committed acceptance, engage and make them work better and don't you know, feel unhappy that those ex that, that that those were missed because they were never expectations anyway. They were just ambitions. Yeah, great. Another question, maybe from Matt. Hi, Mo. It sounds like your ideas on control largely follows the ideas in Stoicism. What are your thoughts on Stoicism and as a philosophy? I get, I get that question a lot, and I love Stoicism. And I, and I, but 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 I will have to say that spiritual teachings in general suffer from a bit of an attention bias. Okay, so uh, so we those of us who adore Stoicism will think that what I talk about is Stoicism. I also get that question, that, that same comment from Buddhism, which which will tell me that's very clearly what Buddhism is about. Uh, Hinduism will say detachment is exactly the same. Uh, Islam will say the idea of surrender is exactly the same, Sufism and so on and so forth, right? So so those are, you know, I, I always say the human manual wasn't written yesterday. I think, uh, I think there is a lot of interesting wisdom that is enhanced with modern science and with modern uh, uh, understanding of the human machine uh, about what makes us happy or unhappy, okay? Uh, I found in my life that there is a lot of beauty in the core of all spiritual teachings and that there is a lot of crap that surrounds a bit of them or, or, or all of them, okay? There is a bit of crap, let me put it that way. There is a bit of crowd crap that surrounds all of them, okay? So, so some of the core of, of religions and spiritual teachings is wonderful and then humans walk in like bureaucrats and start to go do and don't, and this is wrong and this is right, and don't say this and don't do that and so on and so forth. And that's where it falls uh, apart if you want and, and, and it becomes a little uh, off center, okay? So my approach to, to, to things is I try to mix, uh, I, I, so I studied all of those, by the way, I started Stoicism, I, started, uh, I studied um, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Sufism, Islam, uh, Christianity, and Judaism. Okay, and and when when and a bit of shamanic beliefs and and spiritual teachings as well. And when you put it all together and put a bit of science and mathematics and a bit of physics and so on and so forth, you know, neuroscience and so on, it starts to make a lot more sense. And that's where my joy and excitement comes uh, across. So whichever path you choose, by the way, is my message. Huh? Whichever path you choose, if you choose the path of stoicism and that gets you there. Perfect. If you choose the path of uh, of uh, of um, neuroscience or psychology, and that gets you there, perfect. Uh, and all I'm asking people to do is to understand that there is a path that fits you. Okay. My path involved a little bit of engineering, a little bit of mathematics, a little bit of science, a little bit of spirituality. But it doesn't have to be your path, and it doesn't have to. You don't have to force it as the path of others. It's up. To, it's up to all of us to convince others that they need to find that path that suits them, but it's not up to us to tell them what that path is. Wonderful. I'm wondering whether we have time for one last question from someone. And then we'll... Bendy, hi Mo. How have your philosophies on happiness and control affected your own personal life in terms of relationships? That's interesting. Oh, wonderful question. Uh... Yeah, I I th I think the first the the top, the top illusion that affected my uh, my relationships was an illusion that I call the illusion of knowledge. I thought that what I knew about myself and how relationships uh, could be 
uh, was uh, was right. Hmm? Uh, as a matter of fact, I think one of my most wonderful experiences in the last four and a half years was embracing my feminine side, understanding truly how the feminine works. And that has impacted my relationships in very, very interesting way because I wasn't able, you know, when they say men are from uh, Mars and, and women are from Venus, you can actually understand and relate how Venus thinks. Okay, uh, control is an illusion. And when you try to control your partner in a relationship, by definition, you're creating a prison that they are going to uh, run away from. When you try to control your employees uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in your relationship, by definition, they're going to look for a nicer manager. When you try to control you know, uh, anyone that comes into your life in any way, shape, or form, by definition, they're going to try to escape just as much as you try to escape. And so allowing people to understand what you need and what you want in life without trying to force them to, uh, to, 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 to comply to the way you do things so they can deliver what you need in their own way uh, if they want to. I think I found that to be the best uh, way to, to maintain a wonderful relationship and to do it the other way around, to be able to openly ask people what you know that you want in your life, what they need in their life. And as a result, ask them if they don't mind you doing it your way, as long as you deliver that result without the need for control from their side. From their side. Long question, by the way, can't be answered in one minute, but wonderful question and very important. Well, thank you for answering it. And thank you all for being here today with us. Um, this has been very inspiring and hopefully we'll see you again, Mo. So thank you very much. I'm always available. Uh, and yeah, do stay in touch. Uh, find me on, uh, on social media. I answer every comment and every question that I get. Yeah, and we all need to read the book again and again and listen to your wonderful podcast. So uh, seeing you, hearing you there for sure. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Mo, for being here today with Thank us. You, Katka. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Bye.